I just want to say, well done for making it. You made it through the 70 mile hour gusts of wind. I think everyone's houses are still standing so far. Okay, well done for getting here. It takes an effort. We didn't even get past the front door as a family. Uh, I, we got up and our first response was, I'm sitting on the front row on my own today because uh, our, our two-year-old decided to do a little bit of a projectile uh, vomit on the, on the team uh, before we got through the front door. So I was like, yes, thank you, son. Thanks for your blessing. And I went out alone and the Vivi's with uh, the baby today. But God's doing some incredible things isn't he, through the local church. You know, I just love what Ben said, actually, that we're in this kind of time where God's moving in so many different ways. And, and just seeing how just Ashley's sister came over here. Ashley's the, the singer there. And she's from France. Is she wonderful? She's wonderful. And seeing how her... She's great, yeah. Seeing how her sister came over and then was just impacted by God and she recommitted her life to God. Then she went back to France and, uh, and then she went to church last week. Isn't that amazing? And uh, there's loads of just stories of God, God just impacting people. We're not even seeing the benefits of it here, but they're getting impacted by the local church. Didier went into full-time ministry last Sunday. So it was his first time, first Sunday, full-time. He's got a new build, uh, which he's gonna start very, very soon. Uh, so that's happening as well. I really like that one of Jeremy's uh, preschool teachers got really impacted here over the Christmas shows. And now she's doing a, a, an alpha course at her local church as well. Isn't that amazing? So there's all this stuff happening. And it just things just seem to keep growing. And I just want to kind of encourage us and just speak in to the body today to say, keep being bold in telling people about the stories of what Jesus is doing. Because when we speak out the word of faith, this is how God is moving in our lives. It says to the world that Jesus is alive. We need to keep telling and speaking out the stories of God, of what's happening in and through the local church. It was great to have uh, the Chichester Harbour run here yesterday as well. Over 500 people were here on site running in their Lycra. I wasn't one of them. Uh, not this time, next time. So thanks Rob and Joe and Andy and Rebe Becky, all the guys that were involved in putting that together as well and serving all those people. It was amazing. But God's just doing so many new things. You know, we're always telling the story of what God is doing. I was chatting with a guy called Mal Fletcher this week. He's speaking in the church. Uh, in May, he's a social commentator and a futurist. He works for the BBC and coming on Sky and he talks behind the scenes to governments. And I was just talking to him about the things that God has been doing in and through the local church. We were just a small house group and God is growing and taking us above and beyond into new things. You know, we just got to keep taking up courage, having courage to keep telling stories. This is what God is doing. We have to keep propelling the good news of God and in, a, in an environment that sometimes can be very negative. We were laughing at training nights on Wednesday, we were telling stories of when we often announce things that we're about to embark on. Sometimes the return comments aren't always very positive, especially uh, online. So we love Carla and our kids team, and we were launching a new, t new time travel series. And the response online was, oh great, more lies you're telling our kids. So that was, went down really well. Um, and we launched the 2020 vision uh, video uh, someone put up there please take this post down religious groups scare me uh, well they scare me too was my response uh, that's why you need Jesus you need a relationship uh, with God uh, one of my favourites is we have the guys you love the blue army down, down the lane with their signs one of them says <laughs> and one of them was uh, we love Emsworth and, and the response was well stop banging on about loving Emsworth you're not even in Emsworth because uh, technically we're in the Hermitage area and many but our dress is Emsworth. And, and uh, we've got this incredible youth work. And uh, someone once said, uh, the problem with new life is there's too many unruly youth in the church. And they're usually Ben Knight's children, I just want to say we're there. So they're not mine. Mine don't even get here, right? So, but you, you, know, you know, it's kind of like when you're on the front line and when you're projecting in faith, uh, what you believe God wants to do through the local church. You've got to be confident, haven't you? You've got to hold on to your confidence. You've got to keep projecting out by faith the good news stories of what God is doing. The enemy is 
the accuser of the church. And the Christian's job is to be the storyteller of the church. Once you stop talking about church and what it's doing, you quickly stop talking about Jesus. And when you stop talking about people encountering Jesus, you stop quickly pointing people towards church. Now remember, church, if you're new here, is not the building. It's the people of God that are interacting. There's an interaction with the people of God and the Holy Spirit. You know, there's that, there's that, that verse in Revelation 12, 11. Yes, we're starting with Revelation. There's going to be a lot of scripture right up front today, so you have to bear with us. But it's kind of, this is a great verse on this is how we fight our battles, okay? Our church, this is how we win. Revelation 12, 11 says, Then I heard a voice in heaven say, Now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the, here we go, the accuser of the brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been held down. Now here's how we trump. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb. Okay, in other words, for what Christ did on the cross, our debt and our sin is in the past. It's been washed away. We're a new creation before God. And by the power and word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink back from death. Therefore, rejoice. Rejoice, you heavens. Job description for the enemy is to be the accuser. Job description for the victorious Christian is to be the storyteller of what God is doing in the now. That's powerful. Sometimes we get a bit of friendly fire or not so friendly fire. But our primary job, the way we triumph, we're in victory because of what Christ has done on the cross. Our sins have been forgiven. But the way we live out the victory. And my advice as a pastor or being a youth worker is keep telling the stories of what God is doing because seven in one will always push us to what isn't happening, how we should do, be doing things better, how we can improve, and that's all important. But you know what? The importance for us as a local church is to say, this is what God's doing. And we move by expectancy, don't we? If you're expecting God to move, then you'll start looking for God to move. How many start looking for God to move? Then you'll see opportunity to move into and then you'll start to see God move. It's like playing I spy with my little eye. Okay, but let's not say grey because that's everywhere, colour grey. But uh, I spy with my, you know, my eye, you know, it could be go for red. If you start searching for the colour, there's not a lot of red in here, but there's a couple of people wearing red. And you start looking and expectations start growing within you because you're searching for the story. You're searching for the good news. When we do good news stories, I love it, we have to remind ourselves and keep searching for the good news of what Jesus is doing. You know, Brits, we have a real sense of false humility, don't we? We're not great at confidence. You know, I like what uh, Steve Mawson once said, that we have kind of that crab mentality here, don't we? We've put crabs in a bucket and one starts to climb out the other crabs start to pull it back down. And a lot of Brits are very cynical. We go for that and it's part of our humour and it's funny. But what I want us to do and be as a church is be a culture that is building confidence in one another to search out for what God is doing amongst us. Do you believe that? It's so key, isn't it? That's just the introduction, but it's so key that we search for this. Hebrews 10 says this, we're going to read it from three translations. Remember those early days, and you know the promise. After you had received the light, when you endured in great conflict, full of suffering, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side by those who were so treated. 
you suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. Don't throw it away. In time, it will be richly rewarded. The context was they were persecuting Christians and they were putting them in prison, but there was no government support or social support for the prisoners. That was the job of friends and family to bring clothing, to bring food. But when Christians would go and support those other Christians in prison, essentially they were highlighting saying, I'm a Christian. Then the government would go back, this was in Rome, and take the possessions away from the Christians who were supporting other Christians who had been persecuted and placed in prison. It's powerful, isn't it, the context. New Living Translation says, do not throw away your confidence, trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. The Amplified says, do not therefore fling away your fearless confidence, for it has a glorious and great reward. We can fling away our confidence. It says it's actually possible to be confident, to be walking with the Lord, to know what you're called to in life. It says that the gifts of God are irrevocable. In other words, they can't be moved away from you. But what we tend to do in life is we cast away our confidence. So the battle isn't actually over your gift set in one sense. The battle is over the confidence. So many people have a calling on their lives and they remember that moment when God impacted them. They know their gift set, they've studied for them, but they're kind of like sitting on the sub bench in the football team because their confidence has been robbed. So from going out there and being missionaries in the world around them, they go to be sitting on, on the sidelines. So just as a question, first of all, first point, what is it that steals your confidence? Socrates says, to know thyself is the beginning of all wisdom. What steals your confidence? You know, when I meet with my, uh, one of the guys who's coaching me, we often do something called RPMs, okay? Like on a car, the, the handsets of RPMs. And they stand for relational, physical, mental, and spiritual. And he looks into my life and he wants to see how my RPMs are, are doing. Often relationships can be the thing that steals your confidence, steal your confidence. Some people walk in the room and it's amazing. They, they lift the people around them, don't they? They come and they lift you up. You're like, you feel like you've grown two inches because you're hanging around with them. But some relationships, they drain the room of energy. How many people are sitting next to someone? Oh, just kidding. You don't have to say that. <laughs> if, especially if it's your husband right there. You're like, she drains me, that guy. It's been a hard week. <laughs> Relationships. We have to surround ourselves with the right kind of people. Some relationships we have to put on mute because they drain us. And other relationships we have to work to getting around because they're people of faith and hope and love and they're lifting spirits all the time. Physically, when I'm depleted of energy, I tend to lose confidence. How fit are you? How are you working out? Mark 12, 30 says that we're to love the Lord, our God, with all our heart, our soul, our mind, but also our strength. It can be marked out in calories and energy. When I'm depleted of physical energy, so often then I start to be depleted of mental health and energy as well. You often say, how are you sleeping at night? I've got ADHD, so when I, my eyes close, my brain carries on. <laughs> It just sparks start to fly. I was, in, I was in bed on Friday night and my wife just gave me the nudge because I keep rolling around and I'm not moving. And she said, go and sleep downstairs in the garden with, with Holly the cat, you know. No love in our relationship. I don't know where that's gone. But it's because sometimes, <laughs> this is generally true. Some of you are like me, you know how it is. Some of you just looking stereo like this is weird. Thanks, Matt. Uh, but... Uh, you know, I'll close my eyes and then I see, you'll see sparks just flying boop, 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 around your mind because your mind isn't switching off. What time are you putting your mobile down? The blue light keeps you awake. What time do you stop watching television at night? What are you feeding your mind on? What we feed grows, what we starve dies. 
what we're feeding our minds on. Then spiritually, we can be robbed of confidence because we're just not spending enough time in relationship with God. And I was saying to Ben, we were laughing this week, you could do 21 days of prayer and you can push for it, almost lead it and not spend any time in prayer yourself because you've got an agenda and you're trying to get somewhere. But because we're in a relationship with God, we have to keep finding time to commune with God. Time is spelled L-O-V-E, isn't it? Or love is spelled T-I-M-E. Yeah, T-I-M-E. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, it's a relationship. It's a relationship. We have to work on it. We have to keep working on it. I was just thinking about this story of Gideon. Do you remember Gideon? And he is drained of confidence and he's hiding down a kind of wine press and he's threshing out some wheat. And then God comes to him, doesn't he? And he says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The Moses generation is no more. Okay, they never could change their mindset. They always saw themselves as grasshoppers. They could never achieve what God had for them. Then the Joshua generation rose up. They took the promises of God, but they didn't really empty the land out of those injustices that they should have. So then God had to call another group of people called the judges. And the judges had to rise up. And Gideon was one of those. And the Midianites were stealing crops and and destroying their villages. So he's in hiding and God has to pursue him and calling up to be the man that stands in the gap for his generation. It says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And then I love Gideon's response. This is in Judges 6. He says, pardon me, my Lord. He's very English. He's always saying pardon. Like, God has just said, I'm with you. He's like, pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they went ahead and said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And then the Lord turned and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord. (laughs) He's full of confidence, this guy. He's very British. Uh, um, Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, (laughs) leaving none alive. The first way we start to restore confidence or the first way that God starts to reboot our confidence is with an encounter with Him. God is not just a God to be known. He's a God to be encountered. He's a God to be encountered. The Lord said to him, mighty warrior. Verse 12, go in the strength you have. I am, am I not sending you? Verse 16, I will be with you. God isn't just a God of historical overlay. He's not just a God of who our parents used to follow. He's not just a God that we can read about in the books. God is a person and he wants to encounter us in real time today. He wants to encounter, he wants not just to be known and read about, he wants to be encountered. I was speaking to a lady just yesterday and she said, my whole life I've been, I've had, been part of such and such denomination and I've had religion pushed down my throat. I don't do church, but I'm a Christian, she said. And she said she never knew that God was a God who loved her and that wanted to encounter her. That's the God we serve. A God that wants to encounter you. And that's why like Winterfest, is so important for you young people going on it and the other young people in here today. Because it's not enough. I want the best for my kids. I want the best for them. I want to produce well-rounded kids that get A's for everything. I want to produce well-rounded kids that kind of behave and stay in line 
and do the right thing and that don't, are not sort of victims of de democratic consumerism. I want to produce those kind of kids. But then, you know, when I think about it, I can't even live up to my own standards. <laughs> they need to encounter a God that is higher than my ways. And I think I'm an okay dad. But they need to encounter a higher power, a person that speaks their lives and futures and destiny into being. They need someone that's bigger than me, bigger than you. And that's why it's so important important these times when we pull our children away because God is the one who ultimately says it's time for you to be a mighty warrior I am with you rise up God does the speaking out over our lives it has to be an encounter with God the Lord is with you mighty warrior the first thing God does when he encounters us is he changes our view of self. Do you notice that? He changes our view of self. Gideon's response was, how can I save Israel? Pardon me, how can I save Israel? I'm British. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I'm the least in my family. God can't move and bless you as long as you're trying to be something else for someone else. God has to bring definitions. We're always looking to define our lives, aren't we? We're always looking to bring definition into our lives. You know that famous Disney, Disney movie, uh, anyone seen Snow White? Snow White and the Huntsman. The most famous line is, mirror, mirror on the, you can say it with me, who's the fairest of them all? Mirror, mirror. We naturally always are trying, oh, it's one of my favourite movies, but we're always trying to naturally define our lives, aren't we? Our self-image, mirror, mirror. And then we look on social media and we compare our lives. We're, you know, our friends are in the Maldives on holidays and it's 70 miles an hour and we're in a tent in Devon. And we're like, this is not me. <laughs> we define ourselves by our jobs. Look into the mirror of self-actualization, our income. We define ourselves by other people's looks. Does anyone do that? Sometimes you go on media and social media and you've got some you know, lady pouting there. You're like, I can't pout like that. They've got pouting powers. Where does that come from? But the thing is, that's not who you're called to be. In fact, that's not who they're called to be either. Because no one ever puts a picture of themselves up on social media first thing in the morning when their face looks like a bag of spuds, do they? No one does that. Does anyone do that? No, it's always when they're in the perfect pouting position. We define ourselves by these things. He defined himself that he was the least in the family. He had an inferiority complex. He had child, middle child syndrome. Many middle children here. All the energy goes on the oldest one. I'm a middle child, I get this. All the, all the money goes on the, on the eldest, all the love on the youngest, and the kid in the middle, what does he get? <laughs> he has to fight to survive in those families. He has to fight to survive. <laughs> Inferiority complex, and this is made even harder for my life because when I was a kid, uh, when we were seven, we moved to France. So, I know a lot of people think, oh, you went to a really good English private school in France. No, we went from an English school in France where I struggled to sit down in class anyway. Then they took us to France and threw us straight into, straight into a class of French-speaking people. We spoke no French at all. So what happens when that happens? You get put in the bottom set for everything because you can't understand a single word. And worse than that, we got put back a year so, so I had to spend my time with kids who are even younger than me. So I look like, like, uh, like the elf. Yeah, yeah, that's me. You're getting that. You're feeling the pain. And they're the tights I had to wear. I had to wear those tights. The pain of the moment. I even had to go to school with, 
with, with, with an older lady who looked like my mum and she had to sit with me in every class and translate and people were like, is that your mum? I'm like, this is no good. And just when we got good and I worked so hard to climb out the bottom, I did it. I arrived at those middle kind of levels. My dad's like, yeah, we're going back to England now. I'm like, we're going back to England? I've just learnt French. Now we're getting really royally screwed over and we're going back to, going back to England. And guess what happened when we got back to England? Bottom sets for everything because you're going to have to learn to speak English. Okay, here we go again. Okay. At least, at least in that atmosphere, it didn't make you just redouble all the time and kind of, you know, in England, just keep pushing you through. You might be failing, but just get them out. Just get them out. Just keep pushing. No retaking. Just keep pushing. Inferiority. You have to change over yourself. By who and by what are you defining your life? I love that. Go in the strength you have. Am I not sending you? Confidence starts when you just start moving out. You can't go in the strength someone else has. We can't go in the strength of the past. Do you remember as soon as he called him? What did, what did Gideon do? Pardon me, Lord, uh, but why did that happen? And what happened back there? And what happened to the ancestors? And, and, and God's like, uh, just go in the strength you have. That is enough. That is sufficient today for you. You have to go in the small bit of strength you have. You know, I love that verse from Paul where he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace to me was not without effect by the grace of God I am what I am we feel unqualified don't we so unqualified you know one of the things I really hate is public speaking and uh, I always felt so unqualified I've done an MA with a module in, in, in public speaking now but I remember when I was again when I was a kid so guys just hang on in there I used to public speaking class in English lit was just like or language was just like I would basically bunk off school and hide in the bush outside the science block generally true and 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 when I went to college <laughs> you're like who's this guy on the mic and when I went to college and it was public speaking I would go down the pub and have a few pints to get my confidence levels up, but I never went back to college to do the talk, I just stayed in the pub. Um, we feel so unqualified at times. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And sometimes I stand down there and I'm like, God, if, if you don't come up on stage with me today, they're going to see that school kid, that college kid who's down the pub, they're going to see the guy that's trembling and full of fear. But we have to step out into what God has called us. He calls our futures into being. And last of all, with Gideon, this is incredible. Gideon gets to a point where he gets some confidence. He sees the power of God. He raises an army of 32,000 people to take down the Midianites. He is set for life. And God says to him, now nah, you're going to have to start reducing down that army because if you go in with 32,000 people, people are going to start to believe that you did this. But I want them to see that it was my power working through you that did this. So he whittles it down from 32,000 to 10,000, 10,000 to 300. The swords are thrown on the floor. They're given trumpets and torches. Brilliant army tactics there. And they just scream in the middle of the night and they start killing each other, running away. God has to strip back self-confidence so we would draw deeply of His power and His confidence. That's the place He wants to take it. He will often call you out he will often commission you. He will often prepare the way for you. But then he'll often pull back from you so that you will start digging into the source, which is God. I was just listening to this, uh, this conclusion on geodesic domes. And there's this group of scientists who worked with uh, NASA and they were trying to build these kind of rainforests in these big glass houses and these domes. 
and they would put trees in and the trees would just start to grow a little bit. But after a while, the trees would just collapse. So I did some research and they found that unless there were winds and storms surrounding the trees, the roots would never truly go down into the ground in order so that they could grow and become giant oak trees. And it's kind of like the same with us, isn't it? Sometimes there's a withdrawal, even though we have calling, we know where God's called us, we know His destiny. There's a point where He he withdraws because He wants to see our response to calling. And He wants to see us and show us the way that the future for us is in Him. Not in the thing, the calling. It's our future's in relationship with Him. And as we dig down and start planting our roots in God and in Jesus, then He gives us the victory. He gives us the victory. So just in finishing, what's stolen your confidence? Sometimes it's health, isn't it? We struggle with our health, steals our confidence. We fall into comparison, low self-esteem like Gideon. But God wants to restore it in this time, doesn't He? This 2020 decade is about the miracles of God, the miracle catch, and it's about God restoring confidence. We may be in winter, but it's a time where spiritually God is moving and there's a quickening like never before in the church, isn't there? Do you believe that? Should we stand to our feet? I'm just gonna pray. Yeah, Father, thank you for your church right now. If we've lost confidence, or we've placed it in the wrong thing or in the wrong person, Father. Today we take hold of it, Father. And we wanna hear the words from you that's saying that you are with us, Father. Thank you, Lord, that we can go into your throne room full of confidence, Father, because of what you have done in and through us, Father. Thank you for the cross, Lord. It brings us to a place of humility, Father, but we can look at it and go, we can be confident in our walk with you, God because it's not about circumstance and it's not about family heritage and it's not about what's going on around us, Father. It's about what you have already pre-achieved, the victory over our lives. So right now, I just wanna cut and break and loose every single chain, God, that's stopping us from hearing and knowing the power of God in our lives. Every part of us where we've been stripped of confidence, Father, where it's just through family heritage, Lord, we just bring about the confidence of God God, as you speak over our lives today in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen, Amen. God's good. Should we give an applause of worship to God?